I was young, I had dreams of glory. All these mistakes seem to come like a flood. Until my days, my days, they were done. Myself up to move to the beat of my heart and my soul, sing a song for the dreamer. Uh, this is also going to be a one cut take, like a normal DEF CON presentation would be. So there's going to be a lot of flubs, a lot of hems, a lot of haws. That's about it. Anyways, without further ado, let's get going. I can't even transition a slide, all right. Um, so a little bit about me and my background. Um, I started off my professional life as a civil engineer. I went to college, um, got my bachelor's degree, master's degree in civil engineering, became a professional engineer and realized it really wasn't for me. Uh, I didn't really like it as much as I thought it was going to. Um, I then got an opportunity to uh, start a security analyst position at Barracuda Networks. Um, we started coming to DEF CON, DEF CON 22. So I've been here for what, six years now, seven years now. Um, and I love doing anything wireless. I love wireless security. So I started uh, playing in the wireless CTF and we won three years in a row, I believe. Um, and now I'm a village member. So now I get to help make the challenges. Um, and yeah, it's one of those things that the reason I started off with this is because I forever feel like a noob. Um, I forever feel like uh, the imposter syndrome is, is a real thing. And uh, this talk is more of a, I'm not an expert in this, but it's something that I find really interesting and it, definitely encapsulates that hacker mentality. Um, so if this is your first DEF CON, you're going virtual, um, you're watching this talk, uh, don't, don't hesitate to get your feet wet to reach out to people um, because at the end of the day, I feel like everybody feels like a noob. And if they don't, then they definitely are a noob. Um, so without that, I basically just want to give my background that I didn't have a, you know, a computer science degree. I didn't have um, a formal background in computer security or really anything uh, at all except for civil engineering. So um, don't don't uh, hesitate to get your get yourself out there. Um, so this talk talking to satellites. Why? Um, personally, I think it's cool. Um, the International Space Station is specifically what we're going to be going to cover. Um, but there's a lot of satellites that are floating up above us or orbiting or above us that um, that are capable of, of you know, ham radio communication or just communication from the ground uh, just by, by normal citizens that don't require, um, you know, any special permission other than ham radio license to transmit to. Um, what's cool about the International Space Station, I mean, it's orbiting 200 miles above us, which actually when I, when I first started doing this, 200 miles didn't seem like a lot to me. It seemed like that, uh, that it should be orbiting higher um, than that, but it's 200 miles up. It's going roughly 17,000 miles an hour. Um, and that's 10 times faster than a bullet, just kind of put it in like rough perspective. Um, and it, it, it is going, it's orbiting so quickly that uh, it can go around the entire planet in about 90 minutes, which I think is incredible. Um, and it's also the most expensive object ever built, which is kind of neat that uh, just being a normal civilian, I can talk to the International Space Station and even to astronauts on the International Space Station um, with just, you know, general equipment and just a ham radio license. Um, and even if you don't have a ham radio license, you can still listen to transmissions from the International Space Station, which is also, I think, pretty cool. Um, so here's a quick overview. Um, the, basically, we're how to talk to the ISS on the cheap, the hows and the whys of, of you know, why you'd want to do it and how you do it, the gear that you're going to need, uh, the software that you'll need, the, the rough skills that you might need to have or you know, brush up on, um, timing when you're going to talk to the International Space Station because it's orbiting every 90 minutes and uh, there's only very narrow windows that you can actually um, you know, try and communicate with it on. And then basically just now that you have all this power, how not to be a jerk. I feel like hacker mentality is the, you know, like, oh my gosh, we're going to do all these bad, terrible things. But at the end of the day, um, you know, should you, this is, this is something that's pretty cool. Um, and you want to give others the opportunity to do it as well. See, moving on. Um, so the hows and whys. So there's uh, ARISS, which is Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. Basically, this is up there for uh, educational purposes. It's community driven. It's one of these things to kind of inspire the, you know, the heart of people of, hey, what are we going to do uh, with space? Why is space important? Um, so I think it's kind of cool that they have um, a couple, you know, amateur radio uh, stations on board the internet, or not stations, but I guess, um, transceivers on the International Space Station that are, that are meant for amateur radio operators to interact with. 
Um, specifically, what we're going to be talking about is the two meter packet radio that's uh, unattended on the International Space Station. Um, there are definitely some attempts uh, that, that you can have where crew members might be staffing the International Space Station and actually on the ham radio that you can talk to uh, via voice. However, to try and um, get that to work is, is uh, you know, it's, it's a far more limited and you have to plan far more, you know, up in advance. Whereas the unattended packet radio basically is going to act as like a repeater for you. And it's, it's always up and always operational. Um, and it's just one of those things that it's, it's far easier to get a communication, uh, you know, repeated from the International Space Station because it's done automatically. Um, and there's a bunch of other operating modes that the International Space Station has. Uh, and, you know, you can go online at any point in time and check that. But, but really what we're going to be focusing on is the two meter packet radio. Um, it's also, I also had no idea that, uh, you know, a lot of ISS crew members are also ham radio operators, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, yeah, so we'll just, you know, break down the basics of it. To transmit and talk to the International Space Station, you're going to need a ham license. And that's just to transmit, and that's really because you're going to be operating on frequencies and with hardware that could, um, you know, cause issues for other people. So it's not just like a cell phone where, you know, your, your phone is going to take responsibility for talking back and forth to a cell tower. This is something that, you know, you're going to have transmit power. Um, and you want to be judicious with how you use it. Uh, however, that being said, if, if this is something that's interesting to you, you can listen without a ham license, no problem at all. Um, you know, you don't, you don't need anything just to listen. It's, it's really just transmitting because that could affect other people. Um, and if you want your ham radio license, the ham radio village is offering, I believe, $5 exams, which is, I mean, pretty cheap. Normally it's, I think, $20. Um, but everything's going to be virtual, obviously, because it's DEF CON. And for $5 to, you know, uh, make an attempt at your technician license. Um, it's one of those things I think you have to renew it every 10 years. Uh, I, I definitely recommend checking it out. Um, you know, it's definitely a great opportunity. Um, all right, so there's a lot of things that I never quite understood when I was getting uh, into all this. And I'm, again, by, all, by no means an expert. So there's probably a ton of, you know, things in these slides that a seasoned, you know, extra ham operator is going to know that I'm going to completely flub up on. But um, I basically just, this is something that, you know, I, whenever I looked at, at this, I would always kind of say, oh my gosh, I don't even know what all of this garbage means. Um, so when people always said two meter band, I had no idea what the heck is a two meter band, you know, FM, 1200 BPS, packet radio, all that stuff just sounded like gibberish to me initially. Um, and I really wish that somebody would have explained it to me in layman's terms, uh, you know, just so I could at least get the basics and then kind of dig down from there, or at least, at least kind of get my feet wet. Um, so if you look at that small little equation on the right hand side of your screen, uh, you're going to see it C equals, I think that's lambda and then whatever the new, I don't even know the Greek symbols, right? Um, but at the end of the day, what happens is C is the speed of light. So if you divide that by your frequency, which is a megahertz, a megahertz is uh, a million hertz, so a million cycles per second. So, um, you know, you can think of Wi-Fi as 2.4 gigahertz, uh, you know, or 5.8 gigahertz. Um, just kind of put that in perspective. Um, so if you divide the speed of light by uh, the megahertz of the frequency you're transmitting on, you divide those two and you get two meters. Um, that's, you know, kind of how the math works out. And so when people say like, oh, it's on the two meter band. Well, you know, that's the same thing as saying it's about, you know, 144 megahertz ish. And I think the two meter band is anywhere from 144 to 148 megahertz. Um, but, but that's what people are talking about. So 70 centimeters, you can do the same, you know, the same math and figure out that it's, you know, about 460 megahertz, I think, of off the top of my head. Um, and that's also considered VHF. So you'll hear VHF, uh, two meter and, you know, 144 megahertz. Those are all kind of in the same ballpark. Um, you know, and that's just one of those things you'll hear those terms thrown around a lot and I had no idea what they meant. So I figured it would be helpful to kind of throw out a slide and explain that briefly when somebody says I'm operating on the two meter band. Um, oh, okay. That means 144 megahertz ish. Um, you know, and that's also considered VHF, very high frequency. Um, so the next part of that, what is FM? You know, you probably have heard of AM, FM radio on, in your car. Um, AM is amplitude modulation. So you can see the little graphic um, on the bottom right of the screen. Uh, that's where the wave is actually modulated up and down. So you can kind of think of this waves in a pond. Um, you know, if you throw a rock in and there's a big splash, those waves are going to be bigger and that's going to be amplitude. You know, there's a, the varying amplitude there. Uh, whereas FM is how close those waves are, you know, in a ring and a circle. Sorry, I'm using my hands a lot. I don't I probably look like a magician. Um, but, but basically you're, you're stretching like a slinky, um, you know, FM waves. You're, you're modulating the frequency, how fast it goes. Um, so, you know, there's AM, FM. So we're looking at two meter band FM. So it's frequency modulated. Um, and this is typically not something that you're gonna have to worry about. It's, it's lower level stuff that the radio is going to take care of, but it's just good to know because I didn't know it when I started out. 
Um, gosh, 1200 BPS. So it's BOD, not bits. If you m mess this up, uh, you know, the internet's going to murder you because you're, you know, technically wrong. Um, I always thought that BOD and bits were exactly the same. And it wasn't until I dug into it that I actually realized, um, oh gosh, they're, you know, they can be different. Um, so you can think of a BOD as like a signal interval or like a pulse. Um, and in or the early days, I guess, I don't know, I wasn't around during the early days. But um, early modems would do one bit per baud. So it would basically just be one baud and one bit were the same. So 1200 bits and 1200 baud were the same exact thing. However, now there's craftiness in there that um, allows you to transmit at a higher bit rate with the same level of baud rate. So if you can transmit eight bits in a single baud pulse, uh, that should come out to 9600 bits per second, even though your baud rate is only 1200. I don't really know. Again, it's one of these things that that's just what uh, APRS or the, the packet radio service uses. Um, the software takes care of it all for you. You don't have to worry about it, but it is helpful to know so that the internet doesn't murder you. Um, and then the technique that, that is used for like, you know, packing things, you're packing eight bits per single baud is called quadrature amplitude modulation. Say that at a party and no one will want to talk to you. So um, it's one of those things, again, uh, super nerdy stuff, but it, it kind of helps to know. For me, you can look at that and at least kind of digest it and understand maybe not why it's that way, but at least that those would all, that's what all of these things mean when somebody says, oh, two meter band FM at 1200 baud, you kind of know what's going on there. Um, and then packet radio, um, you know, I guess the, to me, this wasn't any news, but uh, it's, it's packetized data, right? And so that's, that's one of those things where instead of it just being a continuous flood of data, um, all the data comes in, in packets. And especially for, um, you know, for APRS, it uses the AX25, um, which includes your call sign. And uh, I believe for FCC requirements, you need to transmit your call sign anytime that you're going to transmit, um, you know, power out into the, you know, into the atmosphere. Um, and so this, this basically satisfies that. Um, but yeah, data comes in in packets. Um, and, and what happens is say you have like a small walkie talkie um, or not walkie talkie, but a, a small handheld radio. Um, if you were to transmit on that small radio, what's going to happen there is it is going to get sent out, you know, at not a very far distance. And so the goal of the packet radio service, or I think it's packet radio, packet reporting system, I can read my slides, um, is basically to, to repeat that information out farther. So your handheld, uh, you know, radio is going to only make a certain distance, hopefully it gets uh, far enough away that, um, you know, that it can reach a, a larger repeater that's then going to take your message and repeat it. Um, and the way that APRS works, I think I have this in my next slide, maybe not, but the, the way that essentially works is um, you can select how far out you want that message to be repeated. So if you're, say, um, you know, out in the sticks and there's not a whole lot of, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of, of repeaters out there, you might want to set a wider setting or, you know, like a time to live if you're familiar with you know, internet lingo um, that basically says, hey, you know, repeat this out this many hops. And the whole goal of this is essentially to, to reach um, what's called an eye gate. And an eye gate will take your packet radio, your take, take your um, transmission and put it on the public internet. So that way, you know, anybody in the world then can now look at it or, you know, any other, um, if you have a program written or something like that, you can digest that information and see where it's coming from, um, from anywhere in the world. Um, so, uh, APRS was created by somebody, his name was Bob Brun, I don't know how to say his last name, it's Bob. Bob created it, um, I believe in 1973-ish. Um, and if you look at this, this image of the world, uh, every, um, every continent-ish or every you know, region of the world has a different, slightly different frequency that it transmits APRS on, uh, and those are all in megahertz. Uh, so you can see anywhere in the United States, if you're, you know, which is where I am at least, um, it's going to be transmitted on uh, 144 point three nine zero megahertz um, is the frequency that everything is going to share. Uh, the kind of bummer part about that is that because we're all using, you know, and say we ham operator ham operators, if we're all transmitting 144.390 uh, megahertz, well, your transmission will interrupt somebody else's transmission. So there's a lot of room for collision, especially when you figure that um, every time you transmit a message, what's going to happen is that's going to be repeated by any number of other larger repeaters. So there, there's a lot of, um, you know, potential congestion in there. Uh, so it's one of those things that you don't always want to transmit your message as far as it will possibly go. You just want to get it um, as far as you need to go to, to kind of be respectful of the space. Um, and again, I'm breaking all this down because you'll see why it's important when it comes to the ISS later on. Um, so automatic 
packet reporting system. That's what APR stands for. Uh, a, a lot of times what people will do is um, uh, ham, ham operators will have, uh, you know, little tracking device, beacon devices that have a GPS unit on there and they will beacon out, you know, a location at a set interval, you know, it could be 10 minutes, could be one minute, whatever their specified interval is. Um, and they will beacon from the small transmitter to, uh, you know, larger repeaters with the intent of getting on online. And this is useful if, you know, you're somewhere where there's not cell coverage or, you know, this was invented before cell phones uh, ever existed, like, a, I guess, like as ubiquitous as they are now. Um, and so it was a great way to track things. Um, you know, it's a great way to track, uh, you know, you can put them in your car, put them in a boat, put them in a plane. Um, you know, people have used them for hot air balloons, um, you know, and, and just all sorts of things where maybe cell coverage isn't going to fit. This is a, a great way to, to track assets, really. Um, so you can see from this little image there, you know, this is kind of like the traditional what people think of when they hear APRS or, you know, packet radio. Um, they think of a radio that actually transmits the signal. Um, they think of, uh, there's a little device, I think it's called a terminal node controller, yeah, TNC. Um, which basically takes your GPS data and any message data or any other additional data, um, and it and it basically makes that into an audio format. Um, you know, it encodes into an audio format that then is transmitted out by your radio. So that's kind of the traditional way that this looks. Um, however, things have changed now since everybody has cell phones. Um, so you can do a couple things here. So instead of having uh, you know a device that has to have onboard GPS and um, you already has to have an additional piece of GPS information and an additional computer and additional encoder and all this different stuff. Um, instead of what you're going to have here is you can have a Raspberry Pi that does it, or you could just have a phone that, you know, automatically has GPS on board, automatically has the audio cable on board. And basically you, you hook up an audio cable or a sound card if you're using a Raspberry Pi um, to a radio. I chose Baofeng. People love and hate these types of radios, but um, I, I like mine personally. Um, and basically what you do is you use then um, these devices to encode your message, uh, you know, as, as an audio file that is then transmitted out your radio. Um, and the whole purpose of that is essentially, you know, you could take what used to be a giant apparatus that would fill, you know, like an entire desk and now it's something that can easily go in your pocket and the batteries last for a pretty decent amount of time. Um, and so that, that's kind of how this, how like, like the hardware wise, at least what you need or what that looks like. Um, the next part, at least when I, when I was starting out looking at this, um, I thought that, man, I must need a ton of power in order to transmit to the International Space Station. Like, it must just be crazy amounts of power. I'm probably going to dim the lights in my house trying to get the signal that far away. But really, it's incredibly low. I, I've heard that people have done it on as low as um, a single watt, but a five watts that comes on your standard uh, Baofeng radio is, is more than enough to, to transmit to the International Space Station. Um, and really, when you think about it, that's less power than what your what your you know your phone charger puts out, which I thought was pretty pretty interesting that you could transmit up to something orbiting up up in you know upper atmosphere or you know low Earth orbit um, for just five watts. Um, it just seems kind of crazy that that they're you know that I can't get that far, I guess. Um, so this kind of is a better way to to show um, what I was trying to explain is that there's a little tracker. You can see that I think that I. I forget what the name of that tracker is, but basically it's a super small tracker. I think it's about $100 that, you know, will we'll beacon out, I believe, one watt um, at a pre-described interval with GPS and everything on board. And the whole goal of it is that that little transmitter may not be able to get very far. But the whole point of it is that you're trying to reach a single digipeter, and these digipeters are set up by their ham radio operators. Um, and if there's not one in your area, you know, it's one of those things that would be kind of cool to set one up um, just to, you know, spread the net of APRS um, far and wide. But essentially, the whole goal is for that little tracking device, or you know, any other any other um, end node that you maybe have in your pocket or whatever, um, to transmit to a higher power digipeter, you know, repeater that, that digitally repeats it, um, with, with the express purpose of, of really trying to get it to a larger gateway. And the gateway, um, you know, in this case, is an I gate, and an I gate um, can then connect it to the internet. Uh, the nice part about that is that once it's connected to the internet. There are websites like APRS.FI, which will aggregate all of this data globally. So you can look around and see all the devices that are transmitting um, out and about uh, in the world. And, you know, you can look at the other side of the world um, and just see all the devices that are out there. And there's weather stations, there's, you know, hot air balloons, a lot of cars, boats, planes, you name it. There's a lot of devices that are tracked, um, you know, on APRS. And it's kind of neat to be able to see where all these devices are out on the Internet. Um, so that was a full big explanation of APRS and why it matters is that the ISS has one of these digipeters on board. 
which at the end of the day is kind of neat because you figure uh, normally you would try and you know reach a digipeter that is going to be say on a mountaintop nearby. But really, if you can transmit to the International Space Station and have it repeat your signal, so digipeat your message, well, now you can be received on a huge far and wide area um, down below because the International Space Station has a great vantage point on the rest of the planet. Um, so what's kind of neat is I think I've gotten up to 800 or 1,000 miles from how far I've heard somebody else transmit from. Um, and likewise, normally to, to you know, transmit a message that far to, you know, 1,000 miles, you would need a decent amount of power, a great vantage point, and, you know, everything would need to be kind of kind of go right um, to transmit on, you know, especially VHF or the two-meter band uh, that far. Whereas now with the International Space Station, because of its vantage point in space and clear line of sight, you know, down to the Earth, um, you can transmit your message really far, which I, again, I just think is really cool that, uh, you know, the most expensive object that any, you know, that's ever been built that we have the capability as, you know, as amateurs to be able to transmit and relay a message off of it. Um, I just think it's kind of neat. Um, yeah, so this is a website. If you go to ariss.net, uh, you know, it looks like what a website would look like if I made it. Um, you know, the graphics aren't, aren't crazy, but at the end of the day, it's really cool in that it aggregates all of the stations that heard the ISS and have transmitted to the International Space Station. So again, you don't need any, any hardware at all. If you have a phone, you can pull up uh, ariss.net and basically just see, oh, what stations around me have heard the International Space Station? Where is the International Space Station? What messages are coming off the International Space Station? Um, again, because the whole point of it, uh, or maybe not the whole point of APRS, but you know, at least at least a, I don't know, a takeaway of, of APRS is that if that information all gets aggregated online, um, you know, you can see it from anywhere in the world, which I think again is kind of neat. Um, so let's talk about the hardware. Uh, I have made the horrific mistake in the past of trying to post links to hardware on you know my slides, and then you know I find a better price somewhere, or I find oh it's not there anymore. Um, so what I'm going to try and do this time is, uh, if you want to look at the hardware, I'm going to try and keep an up-to-date list at github.com. Again, you can see the link right there. And the whole purpose of that is so that I can update this list and find better prices or whatever, because um, things change. And, you know, there, there are better spots, um, you know, to potentially get some stuff at. Um, so again, this is kind of my, like, go-to hardware, which, again, if you look at it, it's pretty darn cheap. You're looking at $35. $20, $10, $8, you're looking at under $100 to be able to transmit a signal to, to, the, to the ham radio, to the International Space Station, which, again, for, for that price and the skill requirement and just being an amateur and a civilian, I think is pretty cool. Um, Baofeng Radio, this is a cheap Chinese radio. I, I personally really like them. I know a lot of people on the internet have, have hate for them, um, but it works well for me, and I find that it, you know, for $35, it's a great way to just, you know, not break the bank, but really figure out if ham radio, just in general, is going to be a good hobby for you. Um, it has a lot of other capabilities. You can listen to normal FM radio, um, you know, it can be a police scanner. Uh, there's just a lot of other stuff that it can do, and so I, I really like it, and for $35 on Amazon, you can't really beat it. Um, uh, so let's see. So it comes with what's, you know, a little stick antenna, like, wh wh like what you'd see on a walkie talkie. That's what, if you were to buy this Baofeng radio, um, it would come with, but you can build a directional antenna, which is what you're going to want um, if you're going to talk to satellites or the International Space Station, because um, a traditional stick antenna is going to radiate uh, um, uh, its signal out kind of like a donut. So if you're to hold it like thumbs up, you know, so the radio is, so the antenna sticking up, it's going to radiate out like a donut. And I should probably have a slide in there that has, you know, these radiation patterns. Um, but really what we want is a directional antenna that kind of focuses that beam more like a flashlight, um, you know, into the general spot in the sky where you're trying to focus all of your energy. Um, and so for $10, $20, you can really build your own antenna, which I think is even cooler. Um, and then you need an audio cable, an audio card if you're going to use the Raspberry Pi, um, or if you're if you don't use Raspberry Pi at all and you're just going to use your cell phone. Um, you know, typically most people have cell phones, um, and so just an audio cord for that. You know, under a hundred dollars, you can no problem uh, transmit the International Space Station. I um, mean, again, I'm going to try and keep this updated. Uh, if if there's something, um, you know. Uh, Missing from it, uh, I'll hope to you know shoot me a message and I can I can update it or see if there's um, really anything else out there. Uh, and again, it's one of those things, um, you know, for for the amount of money, what you get out of it, especially because I'm sure a lot of you uh, have kids that are home from school or maybe you're a kid that you know is is learning remotely now. Um, what an awesome project for under hundred bucks to learn about physics, space, orbits, math, um, you know, 
all these things that are super nerdy because um, I'm a super nerd, but um, but really there's, there's a lot of other applicable lessons to, to other stuff out there. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to do is turn on Vox. Again, this is one of those things that I'm probably getting internet hate mail for. Uh, Vox is voice operated switch. So basically you can think of it as, as um, when you start talking, the radio is going to detect that you're, that you're talking already and it will then start transmitting right away. That's nice because uh, that means if you plug an audio cable in from your phone or from a Raspberry Pi, the second that it starts playing audio um, over that jack, it's going to start transmitting. Why this isn't ideal is because there's always a little bit of, of space of, um, you know, a little bit of transmit time after you're done talking where the radio is still on and that can mess up some, some communications. Um, so it's not ideal. You really want push to talk, but um, if you're just getting started, uh, it, it doesn't hurt just to use Vox, just to, just to get your feet wet. Um, that's my personal opinion. Again, I'm going to get hate mail, I'm sure, um, but whatever. So uh, I own an aero directional antenna from, it's very similar to the one that's in that image right there. It's, it's like $150, which is more than the entire cost of the project. And if ham radio is potentially something you're not going to get into, you know, are you going to want to buy some giant antenna? I don't really know. Personally, I have one because it's something that I really enjoy. Um, however, it's $150 and it's pretty steep. Uh, or you could build your own. And this is one of those things that I was just, you know, checking stuff out online and I saw that somebody had built a, uh, their own directional Yagi antenna for like $10 in like PVC parts and like a measuring tape, which is like perfect because I build everything with Raspberry Pis in PVC anyway. So I had a lot of that basically just lying around. Um, and a measuring tape, which uh, funnily enough, I didn't even think about it, but I guess it's, you know, measuring tapes are steel. And so if you, as long as you, um, you know, uh, basically sand off the tips of, of your antenna um, to solder your, your your cables to it's one of those things that oh wow that's kind of neat like you can make an antenna out of a steel uh, measuring tape and it folds up nicely too which is the added benefit um i'll have a link to this on that github page that i mentioned but uh if you just want to google it right now while you're watching this um if you just do legios i don't know how you say it that's how you say it but that's how i say it um and then Yagi, uh, all the instructions, the build list, everything. I'm, I'm not going to go over all the, the super details or my time lapse of me building mine because um, it's not really necessary at all. Uh, just just go online, look at it. Uh, plenty of other people have, have done a lot of work um, to, to make that um, pretty nice. Um, so it's one of those things too that like, I personally think that this is a nerd merit badge to build your own, to build your own antenna. That's one of those things, if you're a student, if this is interesting to you, it, it it kind of gives you a little bit more stake in it, not just to like, oh, I bought all this stuff off the internet, put it together, and I can talk to the International Space Station. There's a little bit of that like hacker spirit, hacker mentality, just to like, you know, I built this antenna out of raw parts, you know, and kind of cobbled it together um, to get it to work. And to me personally, I think that's kind of neat just to, you know, kind of have this project of like, yeah, this is something I built with my hands. And, you know, I'm talking to the most expensive, expensive object, you know, that humanity's ever built, you know, arguably, right? Um, and, and it's just kind of cool to me that you can talk to International Space Station with PVC and a measuring tape and like a radio that you bought off Amazon. Um, and it takes about an hour to build. Uh, if you have kids and you want to at all get them interested in space and engineering and STEM stuff, um, you know, or just to get their hands dirty, I think this is personally a really cool project and it's not going to break the bank to try it. Um, and let's see, oh, I don't know why I can't change sides. Oh, there it goes. Um, so this is my antenna up on top of my patio. It's all on top of my patio, obviously, so I can get a better line of sight. Um, and I keep everything in a nice little ammo box um, and I use a, a tripod. But again, you can just hold your hand uh, out there with an extra piece of PVC and it works just as well. Um, it's one of those things that uh, it, looks, it looks homemade and that's what it is, but you're talking to a satellite with a homemade antenna. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so obviously if you build your own antenna, you're going to have to tune it a little bit. Luckily, if you follow the instructions online of the, you know, of the antenna that at least I made, uh, when I went to tune it and from what I've heard from others, when they go to tune it, everything is pretty spot on if you measure things carefully. Um, but the way that you tune your antenna, uh, is by looking at the standing wave ratio or SWR. Um, and this really just measures the performance. Uh, I like to think of it as, um, say you have a, a like a tube of like you know gift wrap right um and you shout down that tube how much of your sound uh that's from leaving your mouth going through the tube is actually making its way out the tube and that's kind of how you can think of SW swr working with your antenna of hey if i'm going to put five watts of power into my antenna how much of that power is actually going to be coming out my antenna or how much of it's going to be wasted 
um, you know, kind of just banging around the, um, you know, just kind of radiating off of it. Um, so it's one of those things that, that, you know, if you know a ham radio operator, I'm sure they have, a, you know, a, um, uh, an SWR meter. Um, you can buy a cheap one online for $20. I don't have one of those. I don't know how well it works. Um, I personally have a nano VNA. Um, it was like 50 or something dollars online. It does a bunch more stuff other than just um, looking at SWR, but it's really small. It has a battery. Um, I personally really like it. But again, if you're trying to not break the bank, um, you know, maybe a $20 one online is worth it. Or you find a ham radio operator that you just say, hey, can I plug this in real quick and test it? Um, you know, there are plenty of older ham radio operators that would love nothing more than uh, to talk radio and talk shop. And it's a great way to you know, build the community, build the hobby, um, because uh, ham radio operating is, is an aging hobby. Um, you know, just go, go to any ham radio operator meeting, um, you know, in, in your city, in your state, in your wherever you're, you're from. Um, and it, it's definitely a, an older person's hobby, um, but I, I don't think it has to be that way at all. Um, the next thing is, uh, it's really just one of those things that if you follow the instructions, you can probably have a pretty good SWR. Um, and, and again, you, I think mine when I did it was 1.3 to one, which per, I think perfect uh, SWR is one to one. To me, this is just magic. I don't really understand how it works. I just know that you want your numbers to be as close to one to one as possible. Again, if I'm wrong, shoot me a message and let me know and I'll update the slides. Um, so the next piece of this is the software. Uh, um, again, I have lots of Raspberry Pis lying around from a bunch of other projects. So I personally like to use Raspberry Pi. Um, I use the software called Direwolf. It's just an app to get install. Um, again, if you check out the GitHub page, I'll have the instructions on how to like set it up perfectly, um, as long as well as like my configuration files um, to kind of to kind of mess with, so you can look at them and not have to recreate it from from scratch. Um, and then when you install Direwolf, it'll also install KissUtil, which is um, what I use to to be able to uh, transmit messages um, into Direwolf. Um, and then the next thing is there's a tool called Zaster. I don't know how you actually say that because it has an X and a stir in it. So I don't know. I assume that's how you say it. Um, and this this is a more of a GUI tool that you can have on the Raspberry Pi, which is kind of neat because you can see, um, you know, it'll automatically plot where radio transmissions are coming from um, as they come in through APRS. So if you were to be receiving uh, information and you had Zaster up and running and you're receiving it with Direwolf, you could potentially see all of the beaconing devices or all the other APRS, um, you know, transmitters that are out and about, which is kind of cool when the ISS goes over and all of a sudden you have to zoom far out to see, wow, look, there's all these people, um, you know, transmitting from all over the world. The, the last time that I did this, um, I got a contact from, uh, from Canada, which, you know, I'm in, I'm in central California, right? So it's, you know, crossing over at least two states just to get there um, in a good part of California as well. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, and those are all applications that you want to look at if this is something you're interested in. Um, there's also a lot of APRS applications for phones. Uh, I personally, like I said, I use the, um, you know, I use the Raspberry Pi. So that's not something that I'm, you know, I've checked out a couple of them for iOS, but I haven't played with any of the Android applications. So it's one of those things that um, I would just recommend checking out an app. You can get trials, I'm sure, of all of these applications and just and just try it out. Hook up an audio jack to your phone and, um, you know, just plug it in your Baofeng and you'll, you're off to the races. And it's one of those things that uh, your phone is kind of the perfect device. It has a battery, has a GPS, has a nice touch screen, um, and it can encode audio like nobody's business. So it's, it's one of those things that before, like I said, you'd have a desk full of equipment and now it's a phone and a radio. Um, and that's all that's really required uh, if, as long as you have the audio cable in between. Um, let's see. Um, so the next part of this is planning your pass of like when the ISS is going to be over. This is a screenshot from um, my app when I was doing the slides. I use this, this uh, application called GoSat Watch. Um, it's for iOS. It gives you a little bit of augmented reality, um, which I really like. Uh, so what you can see, at least from this screen, is you can see that this is like currently where the International Space Station is and you can see like, you know, what its orbit is. Um, it's kind of cool. It gives you statistics of, um, you know, how high, it, you know, how high it is. So you can see it's like 264 miles, you know, orbiting like that's its uh, uh, altitude elevation. I don't know what the, the technical satellite term is for that. Um, it's also going 17,000 miles an hour. Um, and then you can kind of see how far it is relative to where you are. And what's nice is that if you are trying to make, you know, some communication, if you're trying to digipede off of the ISS, um, what this app allows you to do is if you hit the sky button down below, um, you can actually hold up your phone and since it has the compass and everything in there at all kind of like orient as to like where you want to point your antenna up uh, in the sky to be able to get your, your, you know, best transmission or, you know, your best, you know, point of contact. 
Um, and it gives you live stats. It'll notify you on good passes. And then you can, you know, based upon where you are, you can see all the different times of day uh, or night when the, when um, the ISS is going to come. And it also does a ton of other satellites. And that's another thing that I probably neglected to mention is that this is just talking to I or this talk is just going over talking to the ISS. But there are tons of other satellites out there that also perform basically the same operations. All right, let's see, sorry, I had to resume it. Um, but yeah, so this application is great. I think it was like $7 in the App Store, um, but there are plenty of other applications that probably do uh, similar things to, to just check out. It's, it's worthwhile at least. Um, and the other thing too that, that again, I really like about this is that it'll notify you and you can point this app up and you can see like where in the sky it is. And that matters for a couple of reasons, which I'll go over here in a second. Um, so when you're planning your pass, you also have to take into effect the Doppler effect. Um, I really like the, I'm not sure if anybody's seen Big Bang Theory. I'm sure plenty of you have um, Sheldon's costume of the Doppler effect. I just had to throw it in there. Uh, but you, you've all heard the Doppler effect before. It's, you know, if an ambulance or police car is going by, as you can see the little graphic down below, um, you know, if it's going away from you, the sound will appear, you know, slower because it's a lower, you know, longer wavelength. Um, and as the car's approaching you, it'll be higher pitch because it's a smaller wavelength um, relative to, to, you know, the, uh, the object that's traveling. Um, and because the International Space Station is traveling at 17,000 miles an hour relative to where you are on the planet, uh, it's actually having the frequency, you know, its frequency that, that's on board is Doppler shifting. So when it's coming by you, it's going to be at a higher frequency, you know, so it's going to be uh, 145.825 megahertz plus 3.5 kg kilohertz and then as it's leaving you know so as it's going away from you it's going to be a longer wavelength um i hope i did that right if not again whatever you understand um that that depending on where you are situated on the planet and where the international space station is either approaching or leaving you it's going to change slightly the frequency that you're going to, have to tune your radio to Personally, what I do for this is I try and find a pass when the International Space Station is as far overhead as possible, um, or as close to overhead as possible, because then there will be no Doppler shift that I really have to take into account. And again, a, a single pass is about five minutes, so you don't have a lot of time to really fiddle with your radio and try and readjust or do anything like that. Um, so this is one of those things to take into account, to try and find a pass where uh, the, the International Space Station is coming as close to overhead as possible. And you can go Google this online. You don't even need an app for it. But um, I personally found that having the app makes it easier to make more longer distance communications because if the International Space Station is directly above you um, and you're sending a signal to it, well, it's gonna radiate that or it's gonna digibate that signal right below you. So you're not gonna get a, a contact that's gonna be far away necessarily, um, or at least as far as you can possibly get it. Uh, the, the optimal kind of thing, if you're looking to try and uh, transmit your signal as far as possible, would be to kind of hit the edge of the International Space Station and then have it transmit at a farther area away from you. Again, it's one of those things, um, you know, you can see, I'll go back a couple slides, you can see the size of the area that International Space Station covers. So at any given point, you can hit, um, you know, that, that's a large portion, you know, of, of what, whatever that landmass is, Asia and Europe. Um, and then if, if that were to fly over the, the United States, um, you know, it covers a good portion. And when it flies over California, um, you, you can hit Idaho, Colorado, um, you know, again, depending on whatever its orbit is. Um, okay, so this was the hardest part for me is finding out how to actually send a message. Um, I didn't think it would be as difficult as, as it was. Um, but again, I was using a Raspberry Pi and I was trying to do everything on command line. Um, and maybe I was making it more difficult for myself um, than I really needed to. But again, I could use my phone have it been easier. But I, um, but again, with some of the plans that I have going forward, I'd rather do this kind of more in an automated fashion. Um, so I use screen, you can use Tmux, you can use multiple putty sessions or, you know, whatever you want to connect to your Raspberry Pi. But essentially I had three separate screens for, um, for my Raspberry Pi. I had direwolf that ran my direwolf configuration. That's what dash C is. Dash T is to not do any color on the output of when direwolf runs. Um, I have the kiss util, which is installed when you install direwolf. And basically I have the, uh, the folder RX and the folder TX that, you know, if anything I receive will go into the RX folder, anything that I transmit will go into the TX folder. Um, and so that's kind of nice because I can just drop text files in there and then the kiss util and direwolf will take care of converting that to audio and then transmitting it out. Um, which is, which is awesome. Cause then at that point you, you can script up whatever you want. You can do things on in an automated manner or manually. Um, uh, but again, you only have five minutes or so that you're trying to 
you know, communicate with the International Space Station. And then even more of a narrow window when it's directly above you or when it's kind of prime time. And you don't want to necessarily, you know, you want to have everything set up in such a way to where you can send out a single message per pass, um, you know, or maybe just a handful of messages per pass, because there are other people also trying to communicate with it. And if, and if you remember, um, the International Space Station is operating on a single frequency. You know, it's operating on 145.825 megahertz, which again, I don't, I don't know if I put that in, in notes, but again, it'll be, you Google it, right? Like it, it's out there. Um, but, but only one person can talk to the International Space Station at a time. So you don't want to be constantly transmitting because then you'll prevent other people from also communicating with it. Um, so basically what I had is on a, I believe every minute interval, I would have it, you know, copy my message.txt into the transmit folder and they would shoot that message off um, or, you know, transmit that message off, I guess I should say. Um, and so what's kind of neat about this is that you can script it up in such a way that, you know, if you have a program that you want to have automatically begin something out, you can um, or, or anything like that. Personally, I like that. But if, if this is just, you're just, trying to make a contact or, you know, you're trying to, you know, if you want to be digipeded off the International Space Station, that's your only goal, um, you know, just with your phone, you can just send the message out that way manually. You don't have to go through all this dire wolf craziness. Um, most, most phone applications should be able to do it pretty darn easily. All right, so this is a sample message um, and I'm going to decipher it here real quick. So if you see the KJ60HH, that's my call sign, uh, followed by APRS, and then ARISS. That indicates basically that I want to be digipeded by the International Space Station. Then you'll see my uh, call sign again, followed by a dash seven. That's because this is coming from my mobile unit, which is just my Baofeng radio. Um, after that, you'll see my GPS coordinates. They're kind of in a funny format, not a format that I'm used to seeing, but uh, it's not hard to kind of decipher what those mean. Um, and then followed by a dash. And then after that dash is just whatever message you'd like to send to the International Space Station. So it's not super difficult to decipher, but uh, if it's your first time looking at APRS messages, it might be a little bit more difficult than you would have anticipated. This is the folder structure. So when I run Direwolf, I run it from my home directory. Direwolf config is right there. And then I have a TX and an RX folder for the messages that I'm going to send go into the TX folder and messages that I'm going to receive come from or, you know, get placed in the RX folder. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can get this. All right. So, so some of the things going forward, I think that are important important to cover. Um, you know, so my, my goal with this is I want to automate it. I want to um, make some rotors and rotors, if you're not familiar, are basically uh, what it would allow, you know, rotors would allow me to um, change the elevation, uh, you know, up and down. So like, if you're looking like a tripod's a great example, right? Um, I could, you know, change the, or, you know, the orientation 360 degrees, like a compass, and then the elevation up and down. Because um, it'd be really cool if on the Raspberry Pi, you had some software that basically tracked where the International Space Station was, and anytime it was up overhead to transmit a message, message automatically. So that's that's kind of my idea of what I think would be kind of neat. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and then I would also like to see, you know, uh, how far away can I hear from, um, you know, or how far could I, could I could I be digipeded by the International Space Station? And if you kind of think about it, um, uh, you know, out onto the horizon. So if you were if you were out you know, basically to the to the horizon, that would be zero degrees. But obviously there are trees, there are houses, there are all those things in the way. Um, and so there, there's a there's a point at which, you know, you you can hit the International Space Station, um, you know, with a signal, maybe is that 20 degrees, is it 30 degrees, is it 40 degrees? The higher the higher the elevation is um, relative to where you are on the ground, uh, the easier it will be to communicate with it. So it's one of those things that automating it, I think would be kind of neat. Um, and I also like to, um, you know, investigate looking at other satellites. Um, yeah, and basically just, just seeing what else is out there. Um, a huge thank you to AMSET and, and ARISS.net just because checking out that website um, inspired me to, to, you know, try and get on the board. Um, and same thing with AMSET. There's tons of great information there on how other people have, um, you know, had successful communications. Uh, and really at the end of the day, I think this is just something that's kind of cool. Um, you know, the hacker mindset here of just kind of scraping and cobbling together all these things um, to, to really do something that's kind of neat to be able to transmit to the International Space Station. Um, not to mention too that this is how you can transmit to a lot of other satellites and it's really kind of uh, covers the basics um, in terms of what's required to talk to a satellite, right? There's a whole bunch of different satellite orbits, a whole bunch of different um, satellite communication 
protocols, frequencies, modulations, um, and this is just dipping your toe in the water of what's available and what's out there. Um, and, and it's for honestly a, a pretty small budget, right? For $100, $200, you could get a really solid setup um, to, you know, to communicate with the International Space Station with other satellites um, with just a ham license, you know, just being an amateur radio operator. And, and if you just want to hear, if you just want to listen to um, what gets transmitted, uh, you know, you can do that without a license. And really, you can just get a Baofeng radio, um, your phone, and, uh, you know, it doesn't even have to be a directional antenna at that point. You know, if you just want to listen, you can have an omnidirectional antenna, which is basically just, you know, a longer version of the normal sick antenna that would come with the Baofeng. Um, again, I'll post links to everything on that GitHub page, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, this is this is a great way just to get started if it's something that you're interested in. Um, and then from there, who knows how much farther you can level up and, um, you know, what other satellite communications you can do. Um, you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars and, you know, sink a full-time work week into all of this stuff, um, especially as an amateur. So um, it definitely helps to, to have a good starting point and to have a, a good point in time of like, this is something that I can measurably check off a list and do. Um, and especially, again, I know that I've, I've said it a bunch of times, but uh, if you have kids at home, if, you know, if you're a kid at home, this is a great project to really get your feet wet and you learn a ton of different principles from physics to, you know, radio to computers to, you know, protocols to just, just there, there's so many small lessons um, intertwined um, that, that I just think it's kind of one of those perfect projects to, um, you know, to basically figure out if it's for you, if ham radio operating is for you to, to find out if chasing satellites across the sky is for you. Um, so again, I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, feel free to um, check out the GitHub page. I'll post some of my contact information on there um, along with the links to all the hardware and all the apps and all the things that I've mentioned. And yeah, hope you enjoy the talk. Let's see, how do I pause this thing? All right. Uh, thank you for that uh, great talk. We have uh, Eric here to take some uh, Q&A. Uh, I think uh, one of the ones that came up in the Twitch chat first uh, <clears throat> was the person actually hit by that police car. They're a little worried about that. Can you hear me, Eric? I don't know if Eric can hear us here. That's it. Uh, we can't hear you. Are you talking, Eric? Hello, Eric. Yeah, I can hear you fine. I don't think uh, I think our speaker is having some technical difficulties. So uh, what we'll do is uh, he'll just hang around and chat and in the village uh, on the channels there. And uh, if you have any questions, he'll he'll follow up certainly in text and uh, maybe on one of the voice channels in there. All righty, uh, thanks everybody for attending and uh, hope you all enjoy the talk. I thought it was pretty pretty awesome, and uh, we'll go from there.